Well, thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to be talking about updates in COVID-19, and I'm going to try to talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes, which will hopefully give us plenty of time for questions. I am a professor here in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF, and uh, I'm in clinic two days a week and maybe a three months or four months on service. So I do a blend of research and uh, clinical duties throughout the pandemic. All right, I wanna to talk to you about just five things. I'm gonna talk about vaccines, vaccine policy, masking, long COVID, schools and immunity debt, which is what we're dealing with right now, and then just some thoughts on Paxlovid. So let's see what we can get through. The theme across all these domains, the take home message, if you get nothing else, is that there is far more uncertainty than experts, uh, CDC officials, Ashish Jha acknowledge. There is far more uncertainty on all of these questions than we acknowledge. And the purpose of medicine, the scientific portion of medicine, is to reduce the uncertainty with good studies. We should be reducing the uncertainty, but we have repeatedly failed to do so, and we still could be doing better. And unfortunately, I think political considerations have occasionally trumped evidence, no pun intended, and as this talk proceeds, you will see that I am mostly critical of decisions that occurred after the vaccine rollout in 2021, which means by definition, I'll be critical of the left, but I want you to know that this criticism is coming from someone who is left of center politically. So I'm criticizing my own tribe in, in what's to come. I think it's important to remember that the experts that are being venerated and hailed on television weren't always right. You know, back in January and March of 2020, these are actual headlines. One, in, in Slate, COVID-19's mortality rate isn't as high as we think. Don't hoard masks and food. Figure out how to help seniors and the immunosuppressed stay healthy. It was arguably the first great Barrington declaration of its time. And it was written by somebody who's a Harvard faculty member who has since done a 180. Another article that came out in this time was ex-Obama health advisor. The U.S. needs to stop panicking and being hysterical about coronavirus. And many of the same experts who are touted today were frequently in the media in these months saying that flu is much more of a concern than the coronavirus. Of course, they were 100% wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about vaccines, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about is detailed in this working paper entitled COVID-19 Vaccines, The History of the Pandemic's Great Scientific Success and Flawed Policy Implementation. And I want to just read you the abstract because I think it'll give you a flavor from where I come from. This is the abstract. The COVID-19 vaccine has been a miraculous life-saving advance, offering staggering efficacy in adults and developed with astonishing speed. The time from sequencing the virus to authorizing the first COVID-19 vaccine was so brisk, even the optimists appeared close-minded. No one thought it would be debuted by December. Yet simultaneously, United States COVID-19 vaccine rollout and related policies have contained missed opportunities, blunders, they've run counter to evidence-based medicine, and they reveal limitations in the judgment of policymakers. I go on. How can a single intervention simultaneously represent our greatest pandemic success, but also encapsulate deep limitations, misplaced utilization, contradictory messaging, and poor deployment in those who would benefit most, the elderly and high risk, alongside unrealistic messaging, exaggeration, and coercion in those who benefit least, young healthy Americans, is at the heart of the matter. It is important to consider the history of COVID-19 vaccines to identify where we succeeded and where we failed, and that some of these errors may have more broad implications on vaccine hesitancy and routine childhood immunization in the decades to come. And that's my deep concern. So let's get started with this. I think we may forget now, but between March 2020 and December 2020, the media coverage of vaccines in general, and particularly the COVID-19 vaccine, was incredibly pessimistic. The most optimistic actor in the space was Donald Trump, who believed fervently that a vaccine would be available by October, but the media repeatedly cast aspersions on that claim. And these are some of the quotes that appeared in the media. Decades ago, vaccines developed against another coronavirus, FIV, increased, sorry, feline infectious perit peritonitis virus, increased cats' risk of developing the disease caused by the virus. Similar phenomenon have been seen in animal studies of other viruses, including coronavirus. So this is a paper that appeared in Nature that says, don't rush to deploy COVID vaccines and drugs without sufficient safety. And this author is warning that what if it enhances transmission? 
Another article in the New York Times said, could Trump turn the vaccine into a campaign stunt? It says this, quote, even if a vaccine generates antibodies, it does not prove the vaccine is effective at preventing infection. It only makes it more likely. And it's also the case that serious but rare side effects may be missed. It's ironic that this position that antibody titers alone are not what matters was reversed and now we approve boosters and many authorizations based solely on antibody titers. This is an article in the British Medical Journal. The rush to create a COVID-19 vaccine may do more harm than good. A weekly effective vaccine can do more harm than good, said Phil Krauss, who was at FDA. FDA said we want a 50% vaccine effectiveness, sorry, efficacy, or we will not approve this. And now yet we've repeatedly seen vaccines in ultra young age groups coming to market with vaccine effectiveness below that threshold. Trump's rush for a COVID vaccine could make it less likely to work. And it goes on. This is Ken Sepkowitz in, uh, in CNN. The history of vaccines is full, in, full of alarming missteps. Uh, this is New York Times. Some vaccines may be abruptly withdrawn from the market because they turn out not to be safe. And this is a cautionary tale. We are writing to express concern about the use of a recombinant adenoviral vector vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, and finally, Washington Post, rushed Moderna and Pfizer trials could bring about short-term health consequences or potentially far worse, lead to long-term health consequences that we won't discover until months or year after approval. These are quotes in the media and Nature and Lancet, New York Times, from, from May to September 2020. And they all undermine public faith and credibility in vaccines, so much so that when Pew Research ran a poll from May 2020 to September 2020, whether you were Republican or Democrat, all adults in this country had a massive drop in their willingness to accept, to accept a COVID-19 vaccine. Since the vaccines have been deployed, we talk so much about vaccine hesitancy and we... Uh, Ascribe it to fringe actors, misinformation, but we should not forget that the greatest thing that reduced vaccine confidence was the media coverage of vaccines in 2020. And these are all major news outlets. There's another complexity to this story. This is an article that appeared in MIT Technology Review. One doctor's campaign to stop a vaccine being rushed through before election day. This is about the cardiologist Eric Topol. It says how heart doctor Eric Topol used his social media account to kill off Trump's October surprise. And Professor Topol took credit for delaying the vaccine's approval until after November 3rd. Now, the precise reason the vaccine was delayed, what actually happened here? Why was Trump so optimistic that it would be approved in October and it was ultimately approved after the election? You may remember the Pfizer and Moderna press release results in November, just one week later. And the reason it was shifted was the end point. The end point, of course, was symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. And when you run a randomized controlled trial of tens of thousands of people and you're looking at the data, you don't look every single day at the data. You have to pre-specify how many events will occur before you'll take the first look at the data. And the initial statistical analysis plan said, after 32 events, we're going to take a look at the data. And if they're extremely skewed, in other words, 26 people in one arm got COVID and less than six people in the other arm got COVID, like the vaccine arm has less than six and the control arm is over 26, we're going to say at 32 events, we meet, we meet success. The trial is halted. These results are extremely unlikely to occur by chance alone. The trial is a success. That was the initial plan, 32 events. And that 32 events were going to happen in the month of October. You could estimate that by population rates of COVID-19. And that's very likely what Trump believed. There was a vigorous campaign to change the number of events, and Pfizer filed a protocol amendment to move from 32 to 60-some events. By the time the amendment was actually granted, there were 96 cases at the time of the first look. And when they looked at 96 cases, of course, the trial was halted. That's why we have the November press release. That's why the drug came to market. But of course, 96 events takes longer than 32 events. And changing the number of events before you look was the single decisive factor in when the vaccine results would be approved. Now, the company argues that they did so to in enhance the statistical persuasiveness of the data, but that argument is lacking, and here's why. Here I show you something called the O'Brien-Fleming stopping boundary, and on the x-axis, it's the information fraction, or roughly the number of events that occur, and on the y-axis, it shows you the Z statistic, which is a measure of how likely the results are, or unlikely the results are to occur if, they true, if the vaccine truly doesn't work. And what you see is with less information, it takes a more extreme skew, a more potent Z to actually halt the trial. And this is the stopping boundary. And so when you move events from 32 to 96, 
you just, you also change the ratio with which you'll declare success. And mathematically, anything on this line is, is the same. And so in my mind, it doesn't enhance statistical persuasiveness. It was just a very curious protocol amendment that worked to do one thing, which was delay the vaccines coming to the US market by a couple of weeks. That has tremendous political implications, but it's also very bad for people because the Delta wave that winter was devastating and had the vaccine been available a month sooner, many tens of thousands of people may have been alive. And so I do think there is a concern about the events that occurred in the fall of 2020 the rhetoric in the media uh, during the prior administration. Now, the vaccine gets approved. And I am very confident that the vaccine, after being approved, dramatically slowed transmission of prevailing variants, at least for a while, at least until Provincetown and the rise of escape variants. But to be fair, the clinical trials did not measure transmission. It was not, a pri it was not an endpoint of the study. They could have measured transmission with some blinded swabbing. They chose not to do that. I was confident then against prevailing strains and throughout 2021, that the vaccines, mRNA vaccines, dramatically lower severe disease and hospitalization in the elderly. In fact, the older you are, the more you're benefiting in an absolute risk. But even in the beginning, I was unclear if young people really needed two doses at the 21 and 28 day schedule. 21 and 28 days were not picked for optimal immunologic properties. They were picked because they need a result quickly. They need to get those doses in the arm quickly so they can get the result because this is a pandemic emergency. But those that may not have been the right dosing interval. And it was unclear if, the, if young people really benefited from the second dose. And finally, I was also very convinced throughout 2021, and I wrote many topics on the subject, that mandates were unethical. One, because you really need to know that there's a benefit to third parties before you can mandate an intervention. We didn't have convincing evidence that an older person who had already been vaccinated derives an additional benefit by you compelling me to be vaccinated. An ethical prerequisite to usurp someone's personal autonomy is that there's a benefit to third party, not just the individual. If the benefit was just to the individual, then you could mandate I take blood pressure pills or I watch my weight. You know, it has to be a benefit to third parties. And then the second part of that principle is the benefit to third parties has to be so great it outweighs my individual autonomy. I was also unclear if that would be the case because the American populace naturally bristles at mandates. And I worried about spillover effects, political volatility, displacing people from society, firing nurses who had acquired COVID during the first wave while working. I worried about all these spillover effects. So I was always opposed to the mandates. These are my thoughts in 2020, and I think they're largely unchanged. The rise of escape variants has changed the game for transmission, but I'm still pretty confident that throughout 2021 against prevailing strains, vaccines dramatically lowered hospitalization and death. And here's why. This is data from the United Kingdom. These data, of course, have some confounding that there is a healthy vaccine E effect. People who get vaccinated are slightly healthier than those that don't, but the magnitude of the effect and reduction in death in severe disease is tremendous. And it was also present in the randomized data. Moderna has an extremely beneficial effect on reducing severe disease in the randomized study, and it's clear in the population data. The other thing that's clear is that even unvaccinated children or people under the age of, let's say, 30, their risk is lower than a vaccinated 60-year-old or 50-year-old. And so we're aggressively pursuing vaccination in populations where, frankly, the risk is very, very low vaccinated or unvaccinated, and even as we get into Omicron, which has a lower lower risk to young people, and as we get into a world where many people have had and recovered from COVID, all of these risks just go lower in the low risk age groups. In 2021, we learned about myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. It was originally flagged in February in the Jerusalem Times in Israel, where they were always ahead of the game in vaccination, and it was reported to be one in 3,000. The moment I say one in 3,000 and 16 to 19 year old men of myocarditis, my heart skipped a beat because I knew that was a very salient safety concern. And it was a huge magnitude and it was all seen on dose two, predominantly on dose two at that frequency. And immediately my mind was, this is very likely to be a real safety signal. That frequency far exceeds any baseline rates. It was documented by Israel, it was later confirmed by EMA and has now been confirmed a thousand times. And my mind was the moment you have a safety signal, you have to make an effort to mitigate the harm. Yes, you wanna vaccinate young people and protect them, but you have gotta keep the harms as low as possible. And what that meant was we should have banned Moderna and people under 40. Moderna had some estimates put it at two and a half times the rate of myocarditis as Pfizer. 
The dose is also higher. Maybe that's the reason, but it had higher rates of myocarditis. Other nations did limit the use of Moderna in people under 40. We didn't do that in the United States. We still haven't done that. We could have spaced dose one and two further apart. Ontario province had data that the more you space the doses, the less myocarditis you get on dose two. We could have done that. We could have tested lower doses in this age group. Does a 20, 20 year old need the same dose as an 80 year old? Really? Could you have done a randomized non-inferiority study looking at a lower dose and symptomatic SARS-CoV-2? I think it was very reasonable. We ought to have done that. We could have omitted doses in boys who've had and recovered from COVID. Many other nations did. They gave you credit for either one dose or two doses if you had and recovered from COVID. Our country has never given anybody any credit. Right now, CDC guidance says if I'm a 20-year-old man in college, I've gotten three doses. I just had Omicron two months ago. They will advise the bivalent booster. There is no evidence to support that claim. And frankly, it seems a bit bizarre to me. And we could have not pursued boosting in young men, which was what Phil Krauss and Marion Gruber at the FDA, who was the FDA's number one and two, what they had wanted. And they resigned over the White House pressure to boost young men in addition to elderly. They would have settled for just the elderly. And I think this is the key portion where we start to get into the failure of vaccine policy. Vaccines were tremendous. We ought to have immediately vaccinated everyone in nursing homes. We did, but we could have done a little bit better like the United Kingdom. But our failure was we focused too much on young populations. We focus on perpetually boosting the youth. We have college mandates. We are not targeting the age demographic that we ought to have focused on. And that is a failure. This is a account that comes from Denmark. It says, let's compare vaccine booster strategies. This is November 20. This is November 23rd of this year. Norway currently recommends against boosting healthy adults between 18 and 64 with bivalent boosters. They can still get it if they want, but they recommend against it. And Denmark is similar. They say you can get it if you want, but we don't have to get it if you're under 50. European nations are prioritizing the elderly. We have a campaign in this country to bivalent boost anyone over five. And now they're going down to six months. And that to me is a misplaced effort. It's a misplaced. You're both potentially over-treating young populations and you're under-treating and neglecting the elderly who remain still with low levels of vac a bivalent boosting uptake. Let's talk about bivalent boosters. When we moved to the idea of a yearly booster, I believe that Pfizer, a company that's made $100 billion on COVID-19 products, I believe that company can be asked to run randomized control trials measuring meaningful outcomes for people so we can know if their products really benefit us going forward. This administration believed that eight mice antibody data was sufficient for a, a hundred million people getting a booster. And that to me is a very low regulatory bar. I currently have not yet seen any credible evidence that bivalent boosters lower the risk of severe disease and hospitalization in people who've already gotten three to four doses and mostly already had COVID-19. And so we don't yet have that evidence. We do have evidence from MMWR that there's a reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 that's very likely to be transient, but severe disease and hospitalization is the name of the game, and we don't have that. If somebody has had and recovered from COVID-19, I see no credible evidence that there's an additional reduction in severe disease or hospitalization from additional shots. I only see that antibody titers get up, but the quote I showed you from Offit and colleagues in New York Times in 2020 said that antibodies are not destiny. The same you know, rhetoric that was used to cast dispersions on the initial vaccine is really relevant in an age of perpetual boosting. We need clinical outcome data. And I think the truth is, like everyone here on the call who's a doctor will recognize, that the right number of doses very likely varies by age, medical problems, gender, and whether or not you've had COVID. So right now, if it was a 90-year-old woman in a nursing home with multiple medical problems, she's never had COVID, she's already had four doses of the vaccine, and you ask me, do you think she might want to try the bivalent booster? I say, absolutely, you know? It's the risk-benefit calculus, even with the uncertainty, favors, give it a shot, literally. But if you have a 20-year-old man who's at Columbia University, he's had three doses, he's had Omicron two months, and you ask me, should he get a bivalent booster? There's nobody on the planet who can say with data that he ought to. And yet the CDC has the same recommendation for both people. And that to me blows up medicine. Medicine, it doesn't treat everyone like monoliths. It always takes into account who the person is. And I think it's bad medicine that severely undermines credibility. I would just make one last, actually I'll skip this for the sake of time. <clears throat> 
We have an essay out now, which is in the Journal of Medical Ethics. It's entitled COVID-19 Vaccine Boosters for Young Adults, a Risk-Benefit Assessment and Ethical Analysis of Mandates, where we essentially argue that for young men, getting a perpetual booster is actually probably a net decrement to their health. And universities mandating this to participate in university life is a violation of basic medical ethics. And this came out in the Journal of Medical Ethics this week, the British Medical Journal series. Uh, it is already the single most downloaded article in the history of the journal. It's enjoyed massive uptake. And this is a long end essay that explains why we feel that way. All right, let's talk about masking. Now, again, the theme of this talk is that there's always uncertainty in life, but you have to reduce uncertainty. Now, Anthony Fauci famously flip-flopped on masks back in March of 2020. One week on 60 Minutes, he said, it doesn't work, don't do it. And then six weeks later, he said, definitely do it. And the reason I lied to you the first time is I didn't want you to erode healthcare worker mask supplies. But the reason that explanation was always problematic is when they came back the second time around and advised wearing the mask, they told you not to wear a surgical mask nor an N95. They said, make a mask out of a t-shirt, out of a sock. They said, use a cloth mask. And if you were going to recommend cloth masks in April, it's not clear to me why you couldn't have recommended cloth masks in March because cloth masks do not impinge on anyone's supply. And the reality is the reason the mix messaging was mixed the reason some people call this, and this is an article we wrote in Slate, called this the noble lie, the mistake was thinking that the first time he told you the story, he was lying in the sec to protect the supply, and the second time he was telling the truth. The truth is, the first time he was actually telling the truth, and it was the second time that he was exaggerating. Because the pre-pandemic evidence was abundantly clear, community masking was not advised. There were multiple randomized control trials run for influenza and other pathogens. It was generally considered not advised by WHO and CDC. The change happened during 2020. And it was okay, I think. Actually, I don't even disagree as a precautionary rule to try masking. But what I disagree with is to so fervently say we know for sure cloth masks help and to simultaneously not run even one randomized control trial in the entire United States to test whether or not it worked. So it's okay for me to give it a shot, but you have to acknowledge the uncertainty and you have to try to reduce it. That's the core of being a scientist. Somebody did try. This is a map of Bangladesh. And it shows you a cluster randomized control trial of 600 sites and hundreds of thousands of individuals where they were randomized to wear a mask or not wear a mask. And this was run by a group of investigators out of the Yale University and was published in Science. And this is the takeaway result. The primary endpoint of this study is symptomatic seroprevalence. They went to a part of Bangladesh that's rural. They excluded cities. They made sure, or they didn't make sure, they went to a place where they didn't think there had been much COVID-19 spread prior to their intervention. And in the control villages where you don't have a mask, three quarters of 1% get COVID-19. They had symptoms that prompted a test that documented COVID-19. In the cloth mask villages, Three quarters of 1% get COVID-19. There is no statistically significant reduction from cloth masking in this ran cluster randomized control trial, the gold standard of medical evidence. There was a statistically significant reduction in the surgical masking, but let's look at the, the magnitude. It brought it down to about two thirds of 1%. People say that masking is a parachute and like a parachute, you know, if you jump out of an airplane with a parachute, you're gonna live. If you don't have a parachute on, you're gonna die. This is the effect size of a parachute. The chance of survival is 99.9999%. And if you jump out, if you jump without one, it's actually not zero. There's a few case reports of people surviving. I don't know what they do. Maybe they, they flatten their body or something like that. That's the parachute effect size on the top. This effect size on the bottom is less than 1%. I mean, we're talking about very, very, very small effect sizes. What do I mean by this? I'm not saying this to trivialize it. I'm saying this to make one point that if your argument is we cannot do randomized trials because the effect size is so big, that argument is false. The effect size at best is very, very small. And when you want to separate a small effect from bias and hype and exaggeration, the only method that works reliably is randomization. So we ought to do randomized studies. Bangladesh has issues. One, no one had COVID a baseline. So it doesn't apply to America in 2020. What two, when nearly all of us have had COVID. It didn't include cities, so it doesn't really apply to life in a city. Uh, mask wearing fatigued in the course of the study over the course of weeks, despite heroic incentives in the study that could never be recapitulated in the, in the real life. 
Cloth failed, which ironically was the single most common used mask in the years for years and even at, and all the mask mandates did not specify anything beyond a cloth. To my knowledge, only a few municipalities went beyond cloth, a few school districts went beyond cloth, and the German government went beyond cloth. But for the most part, any facial covering would do, even though we knew that some of them just didn't work. And then the final limit of this study is there were no vaccines around. What are the effect sizes gonna be in a world of vaccines? We don't know. Does it apply to the US? I think the answer is no. Some smart investigators, Ben Recton colleagues from Berkeley University, they did a reanalysis of this. They noticed that there's a little problem in this study. And the problem in this study was if you got in the mask arm, more people signed up than if you got in the control arm. How is that possible? More people sign up in the mask arm, but it's a randomized trial. And randomized trials have something called concealment, which means when you get assigned to an arm, you don't know which arm you're getting into. So how can more people get in one arm than the other? And the answer is, concealment must have been violated. They must know that in one arm they're gonna get a freebie and the other arm they're not gonna get a freebie and that's why more people signed up. But the moment that happens, then you have thwarted randomization because the extra person who signs up in the village where you get a freebie, are they equally likely to call that phone number when they have COVID symptoms? And the answer is they might not be equally likely. They might be the kind of person who don't really care about your study. They only did it for the freebie because you pulled up to the village in a big truck with boxes in the back. And in the control villages, when you pull up in a Toyota Yaris with nothing, they're not signing up in your village. And actually that fact alone can lead to the spurious result, which is shown in this paper, the reanalysis of the statistical sampling bias of this study. The last thing I'd say is there's one more endpoint of the Bangladesh randomized trial, which is a randomly selected person in the village checking if they had COVID-19. It's called SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's the second endpoint here. It's the first secondary endpoint. It's still not reported to this day. So cloth masks failed for the primary endpoint. Um, this endpoint is still a missing endpoint. And I think it's the most important bias resistant endpoint. For the sake of time, I'm gonna skip Dan mask. It was a negative study. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this paper that came out this week in the Annals of Internal Medicine. This is the first randomized control trial of healthcare professionals who are randomized to wear a medical mask, a surgical mask, or an N95. And here's what it showed. It was a randomized control trial of thousands of people. And it randomized you to an N95 or to um, surgical mask between May 2020 and May 2021 and different dates shown there at the bottom in different countries. And this was the key takeaway. It was a non-inferiority study. The authors asked, is a surgical mask non-inferior to an N95 mask? And the answer is, here's the result. There was an absolutely identical risk of getting COVID-19, whether you had a medical mask or an N95. There was no difference in the actual raw number and it met their non-inferiority margin. The trial actually showed that medical masks were no worse than N95s by the pre-specified statistical margin of the paper. And this has been very provocative. Some people say, well, it's because healthcare workers take the mask off when they are in the break room uh, or when they, you know, we, or, or they take the mask off when they go home and maybe that's where they get COVID. And all that's true, but actually that doesn't, undercut the trial. It actually shows you why the trial is good. Let me walk you through it. One, the non-inferiority margin was two. Some people say the margin was too high, but actually the margin is entirely acceptable. Why? Because one, with enough time, every single person on this planet is going to get COVID-19. Two, most of us have already had COVID-19, okay? So we're willing, I think, to accept some increased risk, theoretical increased risk in the short term, knowing that we're all going to get it anyway, and that many of us have had it, but we might not be willing to accept the catastrophically high risk. So for that reason, I think hazard ratio two is acceptable. The second thing is they're saying it doesn't work if you don't wear it, but that's life. Imagine I did a randomized study of a diet. My diet is I tell people don't eat any food, don't eat any food. And then people don't lose weight on my diet. Why? Because they cheated. They ate food. Do I get to say my diet would have worked if they had just listened? No, I have to accept the fact that it's a stupid diet because a normal human being can't give up food. And so I have to think of a better diet that can be sustained. And similarly, a normal healthcare worker, and by the way, I've walked around hospitals. There's no, I don't think there's any healthcare worker I've ever seen other than one-tenth of 1% 1 of people who can sustain wearing the N95 for the entire shift without eating or drinking or socializing or ever taking it off. And this trial basically shows you that when you live a normal life and you're a normal person wearing this normally, you know, it's no better than a surgical mask. And I think that's a very important finding.
For me, the greatest failure of the pandemic was that we have had so much vigorous debates about masking kids. There is zero randomized or cluster randomized trial on masking kids. I've written about this in The Atlantic and MedPage Today. Uh, I point out that it might not be all or nothing. You know, it might work depending on the type of mask, the age or the executive function of the child, whether it was indoors or outdoors, dependent on the community spread. But we've done no studies at all to try to tease out when, under what circumstances, if it slows spreads or not. Now we have zero prevalence that's 86% in young children. Despite all this masking, 86% got COVID anyway. And many of them, most of them got COVID before they ever got a vaccine because vaccine uptake in kids is still very low because people are not persuaded that their kids who've mostly already had COVID, will benefit from a vaccine dose. There were schools like Palo Alto. Supposedly, this is a place where all the smart Stanford faculty members live. But they recommend masking outside for children, which is not something I think a smart person does, given that documentation of outside spread is almost nothing. And this is a Spanish, I'll skip the Spanish study. The Spanish study basically undermines, undermines masking kids. Long COVID. Long COVID. Let's talk about long COVID. Long COVID is something that I think needs to be taken very seriously. Anybody who comes to the doctor's office who complains of any ailment or malady needs to be taken seriously. The question is, how do you best help such a person? And I want to be very clear here that anybody who has gotten very sick from COVID-19, who's been on the ventilator and been in the intensive care unit, they have a long path to recovery. You've always had a long path to recovery if you've been very sick and go to the ICU. I have no doubt about it. That's a long convalescence. But the claim about COVID-19 as a respiratory tract infection that is unique to me is that somebody who had an asymptomatic COVID-19, they didn't feel anything, or they had a mild cold-like symptom, can be permanently disabled and can have damage that far exceeds other illnesses. That's the claim. This claim to me strikes me, prima facie, as a very tough claim. And so we need to ask, what is the evidence for this claim? There's recently a very nice study by Wisk and colleagues and this is test positivity with patient reported well-being three months after symptomatic illness. They did something very, very clever. They took 4,000 people they, who came in saying, I am congested, I'm coughing, I feel sick. And then the doctor swabs them for COVID-19. And 722 of their analyzed sample have COVID-19. But 278 don't have COVID-19. They have a different respiratory tract infection, not COVID-19. Okay, And what they do is they give them questionnaires to follow their quality of life over time. So it's a beautiful study looking at quality of life. Okay, Here's what they find. There are some differences between people who didn't have COVID and who have COVID. Some of them suggest uh, you know, some racial differences between the people who had it or not. Some of the differences are that the people who had COVID were more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to have more symptoms. And here's what they find. This is the key figure. The blue arrows are COVID and the yellow arrows are not COVID. If you have COVID, your cognitive function is this at baseline. And then a few months later, three months later, your cognitive function improves and your physical function improves and your social participation improves. For all the things to the right of the line, lower is better. So your anxiety gets better, your depression gets better, your fatigue gets better, your sleep disturbance gets better and your pain gets better. And if you had something other than COVID, your cognitive function gets better, physical function gets better, participation gets better, anxiety gets better, depression gets better, fatigue gets better. But look at the difference. It looks like if anything, they're comparable, but more non-COVID is worse than COVID. COVID looks better. You have bigger gain in cognitive function with COVID than you do if you had something other than COVID and a better improvement in physical function. So this severely, and these are mostly outpatients who are seeking outpatient care. They're not the ICU patients. But this really undermines the claim that a mild respiratory tract infection is a permanently disabling event when you actually measure the patient reported outcomes and they look like, if anything, better than another respiratory tract infection, the typical URI like rhinovirus or whatever. And if anything, I'm willing to say that it's comparable. It's not, it's not a boogeyman. It's not an alien virus. It's more or less like other respiratory viruses. You might say we didn't think about this enough in the past. That's fine. But let's not pretend that this is fundamentally different. It doesn't appear to be. There's another really excellent paper by Pinto Pereira and colleagues that looks at kids and young people with COVID-19 and long COVID. The idea that a child you know, who has very little risk of hospitalization or death from COVID-19, particularly now, will get COVID and have long COVID, I think is a fear that many people have. But this study is, does something quite brilliant. They take people 
who've had tested positive for COVID and those who tested negative for COVID, and they follow them out at three months, six months, 12 months to see their symptoms. And they ask, do you still have these symptoms? And here's what it shows. Okay, COVID negative on the left, COVID positive on the right. And you can see that COVID negative people, they're having more shortness of breath with time and more tiredness with time. And COVID positive people, more shortness of breath with time and more tiredness with time. Doesn't look good. It looks like we're all suffering from sort of long ailments here. But here's the rub. The dark bar are people who initially had, who initially had shortness of breath at baseline. And you can see that the dark bar gets smaller. And this new bar comes. What's this new bar? The new bar are people who didn't have shortness of breath when they had COVID. They suddenly develop shortness of breath six months later. But then six months after that, their shortness of breath gets better. And there's a gray bar. And what's the light gray bar? It's somebody who, for the very first time, one year after COVID, they get shortness of breath. They never had in the first six, 12 months. And the same pattern is here for tiredness. And the same pattern is here for loneliness, actually, where loneliness, it looks like it's more comparable. What does this tell you? This tells you that it's not the same kid who's got shortness of breath or loneliness month after month after month, it's not getting better. That kid got better. A different kid had loneliness. Sorry, you need to mute yourself. A different kid had COVID. A different kid had, uh, sorry, a different kid had shortness of breath. A different kid had loneliness. What, so what does this mean? This is very important that it's not a persistent disabling event. There are people who are developing these symptoms all the time, feeling sad, pain, usual care, poor well-being, and they're developing it for the first time one year after COVID. And in my mind, I think you really have to ask yourself how much of this is long COVID and how much of it is long pandemic. Their lives have been seriously disrupted. They haven't had sports or socialization or playing and all that kind of baggage make, may, might make someone have shortness of breath or fatigue in month six. And it might not be related to the COVID-19. And here, severe fatigue, you know, not much of a difference. And in fact, people are mostly getting better. The group that had it is mostly getting better. So what's my point about long COVID? I think long COVID requires randomized studies to see what works or what doesn't. The US, of course, is trying Paxlovid because we got a lot of it because we already spent 10 billion on it. Other countries may try different things. I think it's important to separate that people who've been really sick they always have a long path to recovery. I have not yet seen credible evidence that somebody could have an asymptomatic COVID infection and be permanently disabled as a result. I haven't seen that. I'm open to considering that. But to me, you have to do a lot to beef that up. And there's another paper in the annals that looked at blood markers that would sort of undermine that claim too. And I think we have to be very careful that a lot of the disruption to life may make people feel fatigued. And we need to separate that from the virus itself. Let's talk about schools. One of the big reasons that schools were closed in this country was a risk to teachers and staff and community. But by the summer of 2020, those risks were largely dissipated. This is an analysis of the risk of getting COVID-19 by occupation. It shows teachers here smack dab in the middle and then the low and like preschool age teachers over here on the right. There are many careers that had higher risk of COVID-19 per 1000 people than teaching. And you know, teaching was somewhere in the middle. And perhaps if you adjusted for socioeconomics, it might actually be teaching might have even less of an effect. What's my point here? My point here that no one could say that being a teacher was like really being on the front lines. This was what happens in Sweden when you have schools open with no masking, no ventilation, they're running as normal in 2020 in the peak of the pandemic. Teaching didn't look like a high risk job. Okay, that's my point here. And I think that was very well established by the summer of 2020. That's why many country, many states here, such as Rhode Island, and Florida, they did rapidly, and Texas rapidly reopened. But of course, San Francisco and Los Angeles were closed for 18 months. This is a study that came out of Germany, summer of 2020. And basically what they ask is, they notice that each district in Der Germany has a different summer holiday. The summer holidays are staggered, so maybe there's no run on the resorts. And the authors take advantage of staggered summer holidays and the fact that restrictions are being implemented over the whole country to separate the effect of school closure from the effect of restrictions. And what they find is in this analysis, which shows the different holiday start dates and this pooled analysis on the right, very clearly to the left, school is open, to the right, school is closed. And these are the rates of COVID-19 spread in the community that has open or closed schools. And what you can see is that schools have nearly no contribution to community spread. This was known by the early fall of 2020. This is from the German experience. 
And here they, you know, they close schools. These are the number of cases when schools were closed and then summer breaks come, summer breaks end. And when you look at that staggering, it looks like schools have nearly nothing to do with community transmission in Germany. The papers entitled school reopening after summer break in Germany did not increase SARS-CoV-2 cases. So now the two biggest reasons we kept schools closed so long, risk to teachers, risk to the community, have largely been dissipated by, by COVID, by, by summer of 2020. What about the risk to kids? This was U.S. data, peak pandemic, March to October 2020. And you look for five to 14 year olds, the risk of COVID-19 per million, one death per million, but the risk of dying in a transportation accident from a prior period is, is 15 times as high. The risk of heart disease is three times as high. The risk of suicide is 10 times as high and homicide is five times as high. And the point here is that COVID-19 was never a risk big enough to justify changing the lives of children. It was 10 times less than suicide in that age group. And yet we did for too long. And some of the harms, of course, to kids were, this is the rates of people bringing a child into emergency department for a suspected or confirmed child abuse. They plummeted and it took many, many weeks before they returned to baseline. There's still tens of thousands of children entirely missing from school districts that no one has any account for, where they went, what, what happened to them. Uh, we still haven't had the full tally of what sort of abuse. Abuse didn't go away when people were tracked, trapped with the abuser. Reporting of the abuse went away. That's what this figure is showing you. Academic impacts have been in the toilet. We've had catastrophic learning losses. We've had two decade learning losses. The learning losses we've had, somebody said to me, you know, they're no big deal. And he said, imagine if we had life expectancy losses like the learning losses. And somebody said, no big deal. These are catastrophic learning losses. And of course, they hit poor minority children much more than rich white children, as is always the case when you take away social safety net programs like school. And so to me, the net effect of school closure is probably the single greatest domestic policy failure in the United States in a quarter century. It did have nothing to do with rates of community spread or transmission. It had everything to do with strength of teachers, unions, and political valence. And my side of the political spectrum, the left, unfortunately, we're on the wrong side of that issue. And we're still on the wrong side where there's some people, even to this day, who threaten to close schools over RSV. Uh, we just can't afford to do that. Closing schools is such a catastrophic death sentence for the life of somebody whose livelihood and upward mobility depend on schools. The risks of school opening and closure were never justified for COVID-19. Okay, Paxlovid. The Biden administration, this is a paper we wrote in, uh, in City Journal. It's called Biden's Paxlovid Gamble. It says, despite ringing endorsements of the COVID drug, if available data about its effectiveness are lacking. And this is a very critical paper. The Biden administration decided to spend $5 billion before any trial data was seen, $10 billion ultimately. Paxlovid has one positive randomized control trial called EPIC-HR. You have to be both unvaccinated and at high risk of COVID. And in that group, I'm sure it works. I got no doubt it works in that. What I do doubt is if it works in a vaccinated person under the age of 50. To date, there is no positive randomized control trial in any vaccinated person under the age of 50. And yet I see in San Francisco, many, many young people taking Paxlovid. Observational studies disagree about the age at which it starts working. Is it 65, 75, 50? And there's a reason why we don't use observational studies to decide which medical products to give people. It's that they're not reliable. And so there is right now an ongoing randomized control trial. It's called Panoramic. It's run by the United Kingdom. If Panoramic is a negative randomized trial, it's going to contradict $10 billion in United States spending. The bulk of that, it's going to be one of the greatest medical reversals in the history of medicine. Uh, it's going to be a catastrophic a catastrophic blow to credibility. We thought Tamiflu was a blow to credibility. This will be one of the biggest blows to credibility. All right. So question time is coming. I will close with just a few thoughts. If, so, you know, w let me just give the overall takeaway and then I'll tell you about future things. The overall takeaway of this talk is, look, uh, the truth about medicine is that many of the things we do are good. Paxlovid is good. Vaccines are good. Masking can be good but you need to know under what circumstances something can be good. And that's why you run studies and something can be good in an 80 year old woman. If you're talking about December of 2021 and an 80 year old woman in a nursing home, should she have gotten two doses of the vaccine? Absolutely she should have. And in fact, she should be demanding why did Pfizer change the statistical plan that delayed it one month? That was a huge risk to her life. And there are many people who may be dead as a result of that delay, okay? Absolutely, that person should get it. 
Should a 20 year old in 2022 be thrown out of their college because they're not getting boosted because they got three shots and just had Omicron? The answer is no, that's absolutely unjustified. So you can have irrationality in both direction. Somebody who thinks they shouldn't have gotten it, an old person, and somebody who thinks that we should just keep boosting. You know, should a young person by the age of 40 have gotten 42 COVID-19 shots? Does that make sense? I don't know if the randomized data supports it, but there will ne there's no randomized data that would support that. But that's the strategy we're going on. We have to not forget, Pfizer gets rich if you do it one way, and they don't get as rich if you do it the other way. Like everything in medicine, you know, the middle is probably the truth. Let's talk about Paxlovid. Paxlovid probably does help people who are at very high risk or who are unvaccinated. But should we give, should we be giving Paxlovid to a 40-year-old healthcare worker who has no medical problems? I think it's very likely it could even be harmful. It could be de detrimental. We wouldn't want to give it to that person. We don't have any data. Should we be spending $10 billion on that when there are things we don't spend? I have people who can't get cancer care because they don't have insurance. We're spending it on this? I think that's, that's crazy. And masking, masking young populations, masking forever, I think this is a delusion. Uh, it's possible that masking for a short period of time had some benefit. But after vaccination, I don't see what the purpose is. And after, because, you know, COVID is going to break through eventually. What it, and, and then finally, long COVID, I think the evidence base is very, very mixed, very uncertain. Um, and it does not escape my attention that the more long COVID is a problem, the more one has a prima facie justification for endless restrictions. And there are some people who want endless restrictions and ergo, they want long COVID to be a problem, but the best studies, the controlled studies, the prospective studies do not have those conclusions. And the, we could talk about the VA studies. Those are very, very flawed. Uh, they're looking at ICD-10 codes and some other things we can talk about. Okay, future things to explore if you like this talk. I run a sub stack. It's called my observations and thoughts. That's what, and that's what you're gonna get on the sub stack, that. I host a YouTube channel. Uh, we have videos on how to read clinical trials. We also have videos on COVID policy. I host this podcast called Plenary Session. It's quite popular in some, some nerd circles. Uh, I've written a couple books. One is Malignant. Uh, it's the most recent, How Bad Policy, Bad Evidence Harm People with Cancers. And so thank you so much for your attention. Pleasure to talk to you. I wish you were in person. Uh, and happy to take any and all questions. Thank you. I see, right. So, okay, let's talk about that. So, I mean, one of the, lo one of the logics is, and I wouldn't want to give COVID to my own mother for sure. And my mother's not far in age from your mother. Um, and, uh, but if me, if me getting boosted, does it actually lower the risk to my mother? And I'm pretty confident it might lower the short term risk. Like, so in the next week or two weeks, I might be less likely to give it to my mother or two months. But we see in study after study, the vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 slowly but surely regresses to close to zero with time. And so what I would say is that if I was going to meet my, if I'm going to go, you know, fly to meet my mother and she lives in a different city and just see her, I might, and people do try to time their booster to try to minimize that spread risk. But if I'm living with my mother for the next five, you know, five years, I'm not clear in my mind that I'm doing much to, to help my mother. And so that to me wouldn't be weighing too heavily. Uh, Cal okay. Somebody asked about, let me look in the comments. Somebody says the California legislation about misinformation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. So uh, my point, uh, the only thing I'd say about that is that um, having looked extensively at the California law, it's actually not clear to me that it actually changes the law. If you were a doctor before the law, the new law, and you went around saying things that were widely out of the consensus of the mainstream, they could in fact flag you and seek punishment. I think the reason they passed the law was to signal that they care about this issue. But I personally think that the truth about medicine is that most people who say things that are against the current are probably wrong. Sure. Yeah, that's always the case. But some people who say things against the current are actually really right. And those people include Barry Marshall, who thought about H. pylori. And I think in medicine, we have to be very reluctant to silence, censor, or, dis or, or try to dissuade people from talking and debating. And I think you have to be especially reluctant to do that when you're doing things you've never done in human history and will naturally be debated. Should you mask a two-year-old? That was the, w the WHO disagrees. The CDC says yes. Naturally, people will disagree. I think nat natural people will disagree. You have to allow that debate. Should you be boosting a 20-year-old forever with a new product? I naturally, people will disagree. So I think it would be mistaken to try to stifle the debates. I would favor, in fact, if I were running the NIH, I would have just had open debates on all these topics, lockdown, shutdown, school closure. I think we needed more debates, not less debates. And so I think that's the wrong idea. Um,
preprints. Oh, somebody asked, does the rise of citing from preprint servers during the pandemic act as a moderating force against the policy blunders or make things worse? I'm not sure about the answer. I think people will study it. Somebody has done a study that says preprints and final publications have a lot of agreement, like it doesn't change that much. But of course, that misses the bottom of the iceberg, all the preprints that never materialize. You know, just because you're in the Lancet doesn't mean you're truthful. We've had Surge's Fear, which is a fraudulent study in the Lancet. Um, and just because you're a preprint doesn't mean you're gospel or bad. Uh, I think the challenge is, is when more than whether, I think the biggest challenge is, is the politics of it. Um, the moment Trump said he wanted schools reopened in the fall, the American Academy of Pediatrics sort of changed their language around it, and a lot of liberal states opposed him, and a lot of red states supported it. That, to me, is dangerous. Probably would have been better for him not to comment. And the more you make schools a political issue, the more you make masking a political issue, that's when you got into a problem where science, I think, is deeply threatened. Um, and, and that to me is my greatest concern is that, you know, five years from now, it just keeps getting worse. And, and, you know, if you like an ACE inhibitor, it means you're a Democrat. And if you like a thiazide, it means you're a Republican. I mean, that's going to be a madness if we get to that point. We can't allow that to happen. We have to agree. The rules of science apply the same, whichever side you're on. And I think that to me is my greatest concern. Yeah, it's a great question. I guess I would say, um, absolutely. We, I mean, we did do some things right. The biggest thing we did right was, you know, by we, I mean Americans, we made the vaccine. I mean, who are we kidding? We're the ones that funded all this stuff and we made the thing. That's the most important thing. So that we get a lot of credit. We did do some things nearly perfect, but here's why we could have been better. The United Kingdom, they didn't prioritize healthcare workers. They only went for elderly first. They gave everyone one dose and then they delayed second dose so they could give more people the first dose. We did a few things different. By delaying the second dose in the United Kingdom, they actually got more durable and higher antibody titers. They probably had a better immunologic response. They got more people the first dose before they moved to second, so the more people were shielded. And the mistake we made is, like for instance, in Stanford, if you were a 27-year-old intern, um, you would have gotten priority over an 85-year-old in Palo Alto. And yes, healthcare workers had a slightly higher risk of occupational exposure, but the increased risk from being 85 versus 27 is logarithmic. I mean, it's thousandfold higher. And so in my mind, and, you know, and I say this as a healthcare worker who eagerly went and got the vaccine, don't get me wrong, I, I think it was a mistake uh, to prioritize. I should not have been prioritized. All the elderly should have been prioritized. And the bigger mistake was the trial shouldn't have changed the primary endpoint. It should have looked one month earlier. You would have saved a lot of lives in that, in that winter wave. Um, that was bad. And I, I, I think that was politically influenced, I must say. I do think it wasn't a scientific reason for that. But I mean, that's not to say we did it. I mean, yeah, we did pretty good. I mean, I think it was, we did a good job. And, you know, we bought a lot of it. That's another thing we did good before anyone else did. And by May, anybody in this country who wanted it could have gotten it. Um, and somebody asked about, like, am I just saying this through retrospectoscope? I always wonder about that. And so what I do is on my Twitter page, I have a pinned tweet. And the pinned tweet is every op-ed I think I've written over the whole pandemic. And I think I've written maybe about 200 op-eds. And they're all dated and time-stamped. And so I think, you know... You can hold me to that. I think I like. I'm not just saying this in retrospect. I think I said it at the time, and you know, there's the, there's the, there's the the receipts, as the kids say. There's one uh, in the Guinea Bissau. There's a cluster randomized trial of forty thousand people, largely pre-vaccine, and it's in the Guinea Bissau, and uh, it has met the primary end, or it's met the it's terminated, but they haven't reported results. Uh, and uh, there may be some smaller studies, but that's for community masking for healthcare workers. I think almost none um that that was really a weak spot i mean i would say that's the low th there's many for therapeutics but that's the weakest one yeah not too many which was mostly negative right yeah and i guess t in my mind and again i i think that was that's one of the worst spots of the whole pandemic because i mean look it's uh it's a visible symbol that displays your allegiance to both an ideology and a political loyalty and the fact that the president didn't want to do it it put everyone on teams and it was so divisive and of course a good liberal it's not just that we want to do it we want to do it younger and younger and a two-year-old's got to do it and to this day i see you know three-year-old kids in san francisco with the mask on and i i was just in a 200 degree sauna and somebody walked in with the three M duckbill mask. Actually, they walked in without it. They put it on in it, which I don't know what that's doing. And it was 200 degrees. And I tell you, the 3M mask was not properly tested at 200 degrees. And so, you know, I think it can be, we can have, we can be absurd. Um, and, and, and that to me, it's really painful because, you know, 
Uh, I wasn't above, like, I was happy to do it for a short period of time. I am critical of doing it forever in my office. I still have to do it in the, when I walk in the hospital. I think that's illogical. Um, uh, I don't want to do it forever, and I think somebody has to generate data. I was happy to do it for a short period of time. I think doing it in young kids was probably too much, um, and we should have studied it. I mean, I think we should have studied it. What were we thinking, not studying it? Um, in some respects, you know, even though it's 2022, it feels as if we're not much better than the plagues of Middle Ages in Europe because all the same things happen. We get angry at each other. We hate each other. We fight. We don't want to talk. Over, we don't want to talk. We create tribes. Um, and, we, and we really are kind of primitive sometimes, people. I hope we get better in the future. <laughs> Thank you all. I see your time is up.